Well, go ahead and open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> and as you do, hope is a powerful thing, is it not? Hope has the ability to, to carry us through the, the darkest of seasons and the most painful of trials. Hope helping us to believe, even when it's really, really hard to believe, that whatever the trial is that we may be facing, or how painful and dark a season might be, hope is helping us to see it's, it's either going, it's going to end and it's going to work out for good, it's going to work out somehow, even though we may not understand how. It's like hope allows us to say, we're going to get through this. We're going to persevere, but lose hope. And what takes over? What begins to move in in those moments? It's despair. And despair is also a powerful thing. See, hope gives us energy and a willingness to press on. But despair, well, despair can exhaust the one overtaken by it of all energy. Any willingness to, to press on. Despair can make it hard even to get out of bed in the morning, much less to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Unable to see how whatever it may be is working for good or how it could ever possibly turn for good and turn out well. And yeah, I do believe that there is some form of a personality component that plays into this to some degree. Some of us in this room are by nature, glass half full type of people. Would you classify yourself as a glass half full type of person? Others of you are shaking your heads no, and you're like honestly saying, no, I'm the glass half empty type of person. I'm not gonna have you raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me, I'm the glass half empty type of person, the life of a party. No. <laughs> but whether we're a glass half empty or a glass half full type of person, we still need hope. Every single one of us need hope because when real trials come along, I mean, I'm talking about real trials and darkness and despair are what we find knocking at the door. What's gonna help carry us forward and help us to press on? It's hope. It's hope. But then that's the question. Hope in what? That's the real question, is it not? Like, where are we placing this hope? And whether you realize it or not, that's what we're celebrating today is all about. Real hope. Unshakable hope. Everlasting hope. Even in the greatest moments of fear. So follow along with me as we continue to look at Paul's sermon that we started looking at last week. We're looking closely, beginning at verse 26, Acts chapter 13. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning them. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of, the, of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm You are my son. 
today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And so what we have here is Paul presenting a concise but very clear presentation of the heart of the gospel, of how Jesus was rejected, condemned to death, executed, taken off the cross, laid in a tomb, and how God then did what? God raised him from the dead. And that's the nail that Paul continues to hammer home to his listeners over and over again. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. Verse 33, all of God's promises in the Old Testament fulfilled by raising Jesus. Verse 34, he raised him from the dead. Verse 37, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. He did not see decay. And why is Paul coming back to the resurrection over and over and over again? because the resurrection is both the cornerstone, so it is the foundation of the Christian faith and the source of real, lasting hope. And contrary, contrary to popular, secular belief, Christians do not believe faith in the resurrection to be some giant leap of blind faith. We don't believe this to be blind faith, not at all. In fact, I would encourage everyone who has faith, uh, whose faith is whose faith is only based on blind faith or only based upon tradition held because it's kind of what you've grown up with and what you've kind of grown accustomed to, I would challenge everyone to examine the evidence, even if you claim to believe and have believed for a very long time, even if you're a glass half full kind of person and you don't really struggle with doubt and you're like, yeah, I believe this. Like, why do you believe this? Examine the evidence that the scriptures point to. Examine the historical evidence and and let it strengthen your faith. Let it strengthen your resolve. Because friends, if this is true, then that's what the evidence will point to. We have nothing to fear. (laughs) If it's not true, we of all people are most to be pitied. (laughs) Because what we're doing right now is just foolishness. So we want to look, is this true? True, because genuine faith that provides real hope and that lasts and carries us through the greatest of fears and the greatest of challenges in this life is not blind faith. It's not wishful thinking faith. It can't be, because if it is, it's not going to last when those trials get tough, when the despair begins to take over, which is why genuine faith in the resurrection is based upon in a historically credible and intellectually reasonable faith. And it's this type of faith that is able to bring real hope, even in our greatest moments of fear. And that's what I want to help us to see today by asking two questions. First question, how is the resurrection of Jesus 
and historically credible and intellectually reasonable faith. How is that possible? Well, let's look at two key pieces of evidence. We could look at a lot more. Time prohibits. But for the sake of time, we'll look at two, starting with how the tomb is empty. Notice how Paul makes it a point in his sermon to say Jesus was executed. He's making the point that Jesus literally died at the professional hand of professional executioners. And then his body was taken down from the cross, laid in a tomb, he was buried. And then Paul tells us what? But God raised him from the dead. But the question is, how do we know that's true? How do we know that God raised him from the dead? How does this give us real lasting hope beyond wishful thinking or beyond a, some psychological therapeutic? How does it do that? Well, let's start with how even scholars and historians who do not believe in the resurrection, they're saying everything that we're doing today is based upon fantasy. They do not believe in the resurrection, but they agree on one thing. They agree that the tomb is empty. There's agreement among believers and non-believers alike that historically that the tomb is empty. And this isn't a matter, again, that's up for historical debate. What is up for debate, if you will, or the question that needs to be answered is, how is the tomb empty? How is the tomb empty? Need to know what it is, what is the most historically credible and intellectually reasonable answer to the, the emptiness of the tomb. Because if you want to put a quick end to Christianity, want to put a quick end to a growing religious movement that's based 100% upon the belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, what's the one thing that they had to do to stop a movement like this in its tracks? Produce the dead body of Jesus. That's all they had to do. That's all the religious leaders and those who opposed Jesus had to do produce the body. But that's the problem. There's no dead body to point to. Why? Well, it's historically and intellectually, it has to be one of two reasons. One, either because Jesus really did die and rise from the dead, or two, there is another historically credible and intellectually reasonable answer to what happened to the body. It cannot be, I just don't believe. It can't just be, I, I just don't believe it. Why? Because that's just blind faith. That's all that is, is blind faith. So let's consider a couple of the best, quote unquote, theories put forward, put forth as to why Jesus did not rise from the dead starting with the theory that Jesus didn't really die. Rather, the theory is Jesus only appeared dead. So the belief is that he wasn't actually dead. He wasn't dead dead. Maybe just passed out from the exhaustion, but never really died. And to fairly consider this, let's look at the evidence. Because this theory requires us to believe that after the nails were thrust through his hands and the nails were thrust through his feet and he experienced the tortures of a Roman cross having to pull himself up every time to take every suffocating breath, after a spear was thrust through his side, and you can't forget all the scars and the lashes that he received from the beatings prior to his execution, after all of this, he just unwrapped his own body after an additional three days with no food or no water, got up, rolled away a giant rock covering the entrance of the tomb that was not meant to just be moved in and out like a door, and walked out without any of the surrounding Roman guards seeing anything. So now let me ask you honestly, 
what sounds more historically or intellectually plausible? This theory that we just looked at, or that Jesus really did die at the hands of trained Roman executioners. They didn't bring people off the cross alive and that God actually raised him from the dead. Now with, with this, let's be clear. Both views require faith in order to believe. But the question for us is, which one does the evidence support best? That's the question. Which is more historically credible and intellectually reasonable for us to believe? Which then leads others to think, okay, maybe that doesn't sound as historically credible and intellectually reasonable. So, well, the body must have been stolen. The body must have been stolen. Because again, you gotta give an answer for what? The body. You gotta be able to give an answer for the body. So the theory here is Jesus' body must have been stolen. His disciples must have stole his body and then concocted the story of the resurrection. Which to be fair, may sound plausible at first, but also requires a giant leap of faith to believe as we press in further to the evidence as one must first believe the disciples were able to slip past all the Roman guards, undetected, then roll away the stone without being heard, grab the body, unwrap him, leave the the cloth there, and then leave without anyone seeing or hearing anything. So we ask, is that plausible? Well, let's be intellectually reasonable people here. We have to admit, based upon the, that evidence alone, it's possibly possible, possibly possible. It's, it's enough to provide some measurement of reasonable doubt that a, a lawyer would press into, that it, the body could have been stolen. It possibly could have happened. At least it's possible that this occurred but still not plausible, why? Because we have not yet taken into consideration what form of evidence, the eyewitness testimony. Because let's just say this theory has legs. Let's say that there's a reasonable doubt to be considered here. Maybe the disciples did steal Jesus's body then how do we account for their continued testimony to sing the resurrected Jesus? How do we account for these men, one of whom, Peter, had denied Jesus three times prior, blatantly denied him three times prior, just prior to the the crucifixion? How do we account for how they all got together (laughs) these 12 disciples who we've read so much about through the gospels, and they concocted a story of how Jesus rose from the dead. And then they kept this lie without a hint of going away from it for 40 years, enduring suffering, some even given their lives on account of a lie. Does this at all sound credible or reasonable? Even in modern day, Charles Colson, Chuck Colson, who was involved in Watergate with President Nixon once stated, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And see, friends, 
That's the thing. We're not just talking about 12 eyewitnesses here. We're talking about over 500 eyewitnesses. Paul making it a point to tell his listeners, Jesus appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And in his letter to the church in Corinth, he says this number included 500 in one setting. And why would Paul do this? Why would would the gospel authors point to the witnesses to tell the original listeners, hey, if you don't believe me, ask them. If you don't believe me, ask her. If you don't believe me, go ask this other group of people. Go ask them, and they're going to corroborate everything that we have said. As they saw him over a period of 40 days in various ways and in various places, Some saw him in Judea, others saw him in Galilee. Some saw him in towns and some saw him out in the country. Some saw him indoors and others saw him outdoors. Some saw him in the morning, some saw him in the evening. Some saw him by a prior appointment saying, hey, meet me here. And Jesus says, I'm gonna meet me here and I will see you then. Others, no appointment at all. Jesus just showed up. Some saw him close up, some saw him from a distance. Some were men, some were women. Some were small groups, some were large groups, again, as high as 500. Some some saw him sitting, some saw him standing, some saw him walking. Everyone heard him talking, all of them. But of all the witnesses who saw Jesus and testified as such, one of the most incredible, incredible pieces of eyewitness evidence we have is the testimony of the women who came to the tomb. And here's why. Because women were not allowed to give evidence in the court within historic society, this historical society. They were not deemed to be credible witnesses. It was the thought that they could not be believed, which begs an important question. Again, let's be intellectually reasonable here. If women were the least credible witnesses in society... So not to be believed at all, why would the writers of the New Testament collectively base the strongest eyewitness accounts on the testimony of women if they were just making all this up? Like, why? If this really really isn't true, and it's all just a made-up lie, wouldn't you base the testimony accounts on more credible sources, at least in theory? (laughs) Which means the only credible reason, a reasonable reason anyone would include the testimony accounts of women during this time in history is one reason, is because what they were saying is true. So I ask you, How do you respond to this evidence? Do you believe it to be historically credible and intellectually reasonable evidence? And if not, if you're saying, no, I don't, what credible and reasonable alternative evidence are you able to put forth as a response? Because blind faith doesn't cut it. As New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, the early Christians did not invent the empty tomb and the meetings or sightings of the risen Jesus. Nobody was expecting this kind of thing. No kind of conversion experience would have invented it, no matter how guilty or how forgiven they felt, no matter how many hours they poured over the scriptures. To suggest otherwise is to stop doing history and enter into a fantasy world of our own. See, we as a modern people have a tendency to assume that those who lived back in Jesus' day easily and naively just believed stuff like this. They just, oh yeah, they're naive. They believe the thing about a resurrection, but not us. We in modern society, with all of our advanced technology and knowledge, we know better. But see, this is the problem. 
Because this isn't a historically credible understanding of what people in Jesus' day actually believed. Take the pagan culture of the day, for example. They believed all kinds of bizarre stuff. <laughs> like all kinds of bizarre stuff. But the idea of a bodily resurrection, they'd be like, yeah, that doesn't happen. I know, only a fool would believe that. <laughs> and what about the Jews? Depends on which group within the Jewish population we're talking about, Pharisees, Sadducees, you name it. Either they did not believe in a resurrection at all or believed in a general res resurrection of the righteous at the end time when the whole world would be renewed. But no one, let's be clear, no one believed in the individual resurrection and they surely did not believe in an individual resurrection in the midst of history while things like evil and suffering and death continued on all around. Which means what? It means they did not believe or understand the Old Testament scriptures like we have referenced in our text today. They didn't believe the scriptures that point to the future Messiah not seeing corruption like David did. Nor did they believe the Messiah would suffer and die like the scriptures teach, like Isaiah 53 teaches. Nor did they believe that any human being could actually be the son of God. Take the disciples, for example. Yes, they believed Jesus to be the Messiah. But they were, they were not looking for a suffering servant, but a political deliverer. As three different times, Jesus tells them he's going to suffer and die and rise from the grave. First time in Mark 8, Peter, speaking on behalf of the others in response, says, no way, that's not going to happen to you, Jesus. To which Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. Second time comes around in Mark chapter 9. We're told that they still did not understand, but this time they were afraid to say anything. And Peter's like, I am not getting called Satan again. And like, they're just like, I'm not saying a word. Third time, Jesus tells them, Mark chapter 10, nothing, no response. But what's really telling is when the third day after Jesus' death arrives, where are the disciples not? They're not at the tomb not even with a possibility of maybe. You know, he did mention this three different times. Let's just go and check it out. Maybe. Why? Why would they not even go check it out? Because an individual bodily resurrection was so completely unbelievable to them, it never crossed their mind. Not at all. Which begs the question, what changed? Like, what changed? They didn't affirm or recognize the Old Testament evidence. They did not believe that, believe that what Jesus told them, this idea of an individual bodily resurrection was completely unbelievable within their culture, in their minds. And so what changed? Where literally overnight, they went from not believing, even denying to know Jesus, to being willing to give their lives for him. What historically credible and intellectually reasonable evidence can give a reason for this if the resurrection is not true? Where an entire belief system held for centuries changes in one instant, changing the entire course of history with it. If the resurrection is not true, then friends, what explains this? See, friends, you don't have to believe. I pray you will. <laughs> but you don't have to believe. But you do owe it to yourself to provide a credible answer to questions such as these. Because again, if you aren't able to provide a credible alternative response... You're basing your, your life and all of eternity on nothing more than a blind leap of faith. 
And friends, the stakes are, are too high to base so much on a blind leap of faith. Well, this now brings us to our second question. How does belief in the resurrection bring real lasting hope even in our greatest moments of fear? How does it do that? How does the belief in the resurrection bring real lasting hope even in our greatest moments of fear? And the answer is it doesn't if it's not true and if it's not believed. But with that being said, the belief the Bible speaks of is more than a a mental affirmation or an embraced tradition type of belief. Even a well-reasoned belief in the historical account of the resurrection doesn't automatically equal saving faith. Because see, it matters little if we claim to believe the resurrection with our lips, but refuse to follow Jesus with our life. As James tells us, faith without works is dead. Just a body without a, as a body without a pulse possesses no life. See, the disciples' faith was proven genuine, not because they had a well-reasoned faith but because their well-reasoned faith resulted in them following Jesus, no matter the cost. See, they, they went from not believing the resurrection, even outright denying Jesus, to enduring unimaginable suffering in order to faithfully follow him. Why? How? <laughs> because they possessed for the first time in their life real life-changing hope. They truly believed because of the resurrection that their hope was no longer found in this world. They truly believed because of the resurrection that their treasure was no longer found in this world. They believed because of the resurrection, what Paul writes in Colossians 1, 13, that for we who are believing and trusting in Christ is our only hope in life and in death, that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, which is knowledge and understanding that provides what? Real hope. It's knowing as the result of the resurrection, they were citizens of another kingdom. It's knowing with certainty that this world is not their home. They're sojourners, they're strangers passing through on their way to another destination. And as citizens of Christ's kingdom, they knew they were truly free, which is what the therefore is there for in verse 38 of our text today. Paul saying, because Jesus died and rose from the dead, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, Everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And friends, it's this reality, it's this belief rooted in a historically credible and intellectually reasonable response to the resurrection of Jesus that not only led to a change in mental affirmation, but a change in life brought about a a real ability to walk with genuine living hope even in the midst of life's greatest trials. How so? Two reasons. One, the resurrection frees us from our guilt and shame. See, the resurrection of Jesus is the assurance that our sin debt has been paid in full on the cross by us, by for everyone who believes. Not partially, but completely. (laughs) Not wishfully, but truly. Thus the therefore, 
Therefore, because Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin, our sin, and because God raised him from the dead, accepting Jesus' atoning sacrifice, forgiveness of sins is available to who? To everyone who believes. And everyone who believes is freed from what? Everything from which you could not be free by the law. Everything by which you could not be free by your works. Everything which you could not be free by your efforts and by your merits, by your own righteousness. It means because the resurrection of Jesus is true, Everyone who believes can approach the throne of grace with confidence, without guilt, and without shame. As our sin debt has been paid in full by Jesus. Not wishfully, but confidently. Which gives what to we who believe? Hope. Hope. Real hope showing us God's great love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were getting our life all fixed up and put together. Not after we had gotten our life all fixed up and put together. No, God showed his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, still messed up, still broken, still in despair, Christ died for us. Enemies of God, now reconciled to God. A truth, a freedom made possible and available by the power of the resurrection to everyone who believes, including you, including you who are wrestling with serious doubts right now, including you who may be on the brink of despair. Just think about how much Peter, oh, Peter. (laughs) Just think about how much Peter needed this assurance with all the guilt and the shame that he was carrying after the crucifixion. And Peter denied Jesus three times outright before the crucifixion. I don't know him. (laughs) No, don't associate me with him. So much guilt. So much shame. Maybe like some of you are continuing to carry. And yet, what did the angelic messenger speaking on behalf of Jesus tell the women who came to discover the empty tomb that we read in Mark earlier? Go tell the disciples and who? And Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. But why not just the disciples? I mean, Peter's one of the disciples, right? Well, put yourself in Peter's shoes. After all that he had done, and all the guilt and all the shame that he bore, if he'd only heard, tell the disciples. There's a good chance that he would have been like, yeah, that's not referring to me anymore. I'm not worthy. Y'all go ahead. Not me. But what's Jesus say? Tell the disciples, disciples and Peter. Why? Because Jesus wants Peter to know that even his egregious denial is able to find forgiveness in the grace of God. Because the resurrection frees everyone who believes from everything the law could never free us from. And you know what that brings? Real hope. It's why Peter darted out the door to go see. He heard his name, he's like, I'm out of here. And friend, maybe this is exactly the message the Lord wants you to hear this morning. How belief in the resurrection of Jesus frees us from all guilt and shame. As Jesus took our grief and our shame 
upon himself at the cross. But that's not all. Number two, the resurrection frees us from, from fear and death. And this isn't to say that as Christians we'll never experience fear, nor is it to say that we won't physically die. Each of these things are true realities of the Christian life as much as it is of anybody else's life. Just look at how the members of the church in Jerusalem, how they fled out of Jerusalem into the surrounding regions as the persecution began to increase upon them. Circumstances that had to bring about a horrible fear. So many uncertainties. Where are we going to live? How are we going to get income? What's going to happen to us? Similar to how the great uncertainties of our lives can bring about various levels of fear also. The fear when we receive a a negative medical diagnosis. The fear when tragedy strikes. The fear that you have when you lose your job and you've got to go home and tell the family and figure out what are you going to do next. So many unknowns in each of these things and so many more that we could list all of which can bring about various forms of fear. But what belief in the resurrection makes possible is the freedom to know and to know with absolute certainty that even if the worst happens, death is no longer our greatest enemy. How so? Because death is now God's means of ushering we who believe in the power of the resurrection into the presence of Christ. No more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more judgment for our sin. See, death for we who are trusting in Christ as our only hope in life and in death is the reminder, is the reminder that not only will we immediately be with Christ, but our flesh and blood of bodies will one day rise with Christ as well. Which is what? It's real hope. But such hope as this is only possible if the resurrection of Jesus is true. If it's not, well, we of all people, again, are most to be pitied because our faith is futile. It's foolish But if it's real, if it's true, church, it changes everything. So I ask you this morning, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe you are a sinner deserving of God's judgment? Do you believe Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin out of a demonstration of God's great love? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead after three days in the tomb? Do you now possess a living hope that helps you face the greatest fears in this world? If not, I'm here this morning to tell you, you can can. And if you want to talk further about this, there is nothing I would embrace or enjoy more than to talk about this reality with you and how this can be possible. There's numerous ones of us who would love to. But now if not, maybe if you're here this morning and you're just an outright, no, I don't believe then what historically credible and intellectually reasonable alternative are you placing your faith in today? If you say you have hope, then what is that hope based in? Friend, I'd be curious to know. And I'm more than happy to have this talk with you as well. To be able to wrestle through the evidence, to let the scriptures speak for themselves and to point you to the hope that is found in the resurrected Jesus. 
But whatever you do, don't take a blind leap of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that the faith that we hold as Christians isn't a mere tradition passed down, though it is a tradition passed down, but it is a tradition laced with truth. Historically credible and intellectually reasonable truth. We're not just taking a blind leap of faith. We're following the evidence and basing our life on the hope that is found in the resurrected Christ. And Lord, we're asking for you to use the evidence of history and the evidence that is clearly put forth through the scriptures to give us confidence as believers and to open the eyes and the minds and the hearts of unbelievers to see and to hear and to believe the glorious truths that are found in the gospel. Lord, give us hope. Help us to see real hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.